Tonight we have Wilfried Wang. Very, we welcome him very much. He's a critic, but also he is a fully practicing architect. And I think this sort of double combination, which uh, makes him, I think, also very worthy in the, our group. He's a. Uh, he, he was educated. He went to a school in England, and in fact, his uh, whole practice also is in England. And I think uh, the, his, one of his interesting contribution, as far as I could follow it, because it was not so easy to follow this, that in the English situation, he introduced, let's say, the discussions which uh, were also go mostly going on on the continent by introducing texts and work in a magazine he co-edited and he found it with some other people called Nine Age. But this was not the only thing. It was not only the words which were important. It was also the problem of, as a problem of how to represent architecture. I think the other side of how to represent the not available object in exhibitions was another side of his, uh, in, in the field of activities by also not only talking about architecture, but also in representing them in exhibitions. These, I think, were the two rather important activities he was involved in, in combination with his architectural practice. And I'm, I'm quite curious how this combination works. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, my partner is also sometimes very curious how this uh, combination works. Um, I'm very grateful to be here this uh, evening and to join you in this, um, I suppose, exploration of what could be um, some criteria for selecting these 50-odd um, buildings. And <clears throat> I've structured uh, my talk in a way in uh, three parts, with an introduction, uh, the, the 10 buildings that I've selected, and a very brief summary. And the introduction will cover uh, a kind of very brief discussion of what I think might be the tasks of architecture, or what the criteria are themselves, and uh, what the range of possibilities of architectural solutions um, that could be said to satisfy these criteria might be. So um, we've discussed during the week, during the few days, the problem of um, on the one hand, trying to share some kind of common ground, uh, whether it's objective or not, uh, and to, at the same time, identify some of our own personal subjective points of view. And uh, I think it is quite important uh, to differentiate for myself that uh, I think the, the selection of the 10 buildings that I've made, I've made uh, as much um, for my own um, personal uh, reasons, that is, as, uh, as an architect. And, um, and I hope that um, there is this kind of uh, underlying, or an underlying set of um, values which uh, may emerge both in my introduction as well as in the uh, display here on the screens. Um, Ten buildings, to do justice to ten buildings, I think is very difficult in a period of just one and a half hours. And I think um, one, when one has the opportunity to look at um, especially the first building that I will introduce, uh, it's not really a building but a kind of a life's work. Somebody spent um, 53 years of his time dealing with a landscape, dealing with a series of buildings and I will just show the work to you in uh, a few minutes. So I think it's difficult to begin to differentiate the reading, but I hope that as a way of introducing these things to you, uh, you might take an interest yourself in um, engaging in, in the reading of the work. So the, the, the principle of differentiation, um, which I think is a principle that ran through or is running through has been running through the process of civilization for some time. Um, 
for instance, uh, we, we, we know of the division of labor, the multiplication of building types, and uh, the differentiation in construction systems, just to name three different aspects where the process of differentiation has um, had a major influence. Um, but also, in a way, architecture um, has become, or good architecture has become more um, able to respond to a number of different tasks which not only range from the cultural, social to the contextual, <coughs> but uh, to a, a wide range of uh, issues that architecture needs to address. And so that's why I, I'm uh, considering, I, I'm, I'm sort of asking for a more differentiated reading of things. Um, the principal question that was in a way, raised uh, in a roundabout way um, during the first few days was what is architecture's task? And Hans van Dijk talked about um, the legitimacy of architecture. Um, if we recognize that architectural determinism, the way that it was, uh, has always been proposed in the early uh, 20th century, is actually limited, and I think my feeling is that it should be limited, um, we have to ask what is the um, basis uh, for making architecture. And I think one, I would like then to go back uh, now to discuss the problem that was also introduced in uh, discussions, um, the problem of um, how architects see their role in the making of something and uh, the way they would like to control the the production of the entire object. And the, the, the issue of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art that this brings up. The total work of art um, is a concept which uh, is most closely associated in the, in the, in the world of arts um, with uh, Richard Wagner. And Richard Wagner is uh, clearly uh, perceived as somebody whose skill, artistic skills, in combining, um, say, German legends with uh, uh, music that was able to, uh, in a way, psychologically <coughs> massage the audience. Uh, that problem uh, of kind of psychological massage was identified by uh, his early uh, fervent admirer uh, and later harshest critic, uh, Nietzsche. And so we see here uh, a kind of um, the beginning of re the realization that the total work of art as a response to a process of uh, differentiation, a process of um, uh, increasing diffuse directions in all realms of uh, society and culture, um, was in the, in the field of arts uh, attempted to be countered by this notion of a kind of unifying uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Literature, um, later on, uh, or no, let's, let's move directly to architecture. In, in architecture, there's a very uh, well-known essay by Adolf Loos entitled A Poor Rich Man. And in that, uh, that was published in uh, the turn of the century, 1900, he uh, in an ironic way, discusses the problem of uh, how a very rich man was able to um, have a famous professor from the uh, School of Fine Arts come to him to give him a house that was designed from uh, the roof down to the last door handle. Um, and he recounts one event when uh, on uh, the birth, birthday of the rich man, he was given a pair of slippers by uh, his uh, adoring <coughs> children, uh, and the architect comes around and finds out that these slippers, or tells him that these slippers actually don't match. You cannot wear these slippers in this house. Uh, they don't match. Can't you tell that uh, they don't fit? You haven't understood anything. And he takes the slippers away. So this is a kind of uh, an extreme uh, example of um, how uh, the, t the total work of art um, in, in the field of architecture has uh, already found a kind of um, 
very significant criticism. And so, from from uh, spreading out this uh, this issue of the total work of art, it's in a way only a symptom of um, other fields of um, or other attempts at unifying uh, what were seen to be uh, diffuse directions or directions developments of decay of chaos of uh, um, asynchrony of um, individualization and so on. Um, and in the field of uh, historiography we've got uh, notions of zeitgeist, the idea of the spirit of the age that should um, pervade every production of that, of that age. The idea of a unified style of um, um, the phenomena uh, whether it's architecture or literature or whatever. And um, together with that, historians uh, begin to um, invent or try to develop labels by which they can describe and characterize uh, a collection of phenomena. So there's this idea that somehow uh, in, a, in, a, in an era, quote-unquote, there is a homogeneous and unified uh, production of um, phenomena shared by a group of artists. Uh, and we know that not to be true, and we know that it has never been true. Uh, we only know that it has been, there have been instances when things have been more shared, more shared by a group of people, but not always by uh, the whole profession of architects. Uh, and I think that that is an important thing uh, that uh, one should realize. But it's not necessarily one that uh, will make historians very happy because they, they still have the, the difficult task to explain developments to us. And, you know, uh, I don't know what the recent developments are in historiography, but I'm sure they are uh, in the light of uh, also the discussion in, in the realm of uh, linguistics and um, philosophy, they, I'm sure, are making. Um, proposals to overcome this problem. Um, so the problem of the total work of art uh, is one essentially of uh, an issue of control, of hegemony, an urge to make uniform and to synchronize. And I think this word synchronization is a very important one because in, at least in the German uh, there is a translation which means Gleichschaltung and the word Gleichschaltung means very much uh, the idea of control, of bringing together uh, phenomena under one um, centralized, um, well, power. And so, um, <coughs> rather than allowing things to have a kind of relative independent life, um, a total work of art, synchronization, um, is kind of underlying that is uh, the thrust to control, to hegemonize uh, activities. So while um, you know, I've sort of characterized this as uh, a problem. Uh, I don't necessarily wish to portray this as a kind of <coughs> a libertarian. Um, reading of uh, the problem of the Gesamtkunstwerk and implying that you know anything should be possible or anything is possible and I think I hope to show that in the um, definition of what what I regard to be the architecture's task and what I regard to be the criteria for selection uh, something slightly stricter and more perhaps rigorous will emerge so to turn to architecture's task I think uh, it is, uh, its, its task is to, I think, engage with specific problems, with specific sites, with specific buildings. That is in distinction to uh, architectural criticism, which I think engages with numerous problems, with numerous phenomena, with numerous buildings. Um, I think architects have an easier task because they, are, they can, uh, through 
a project through a building confront a, a number of issues, uh, multivalent as they may be, but they don't have the problem that uh, critics have and that we have had throughout and that you will have in your selection in selecting from a huge range of possibilities uh, something that to some, ex to some extent will and hopefully will make some sense. Um, architects, um, architecture should um, offer expert knowledge and we've talked about that uh, also at some length today. Uh, expert knowledge in this sense is métier, uh, the skill, the professionalism, uh, which needs to be constantly uh, re-established and proven by the, print, uh, the, the, the discipline of architecture. Um, architecture's task is um, to provide edifices which structure society. Uh, architecture offers modes for gradual transformation. Um, architecture's means are edifices for habitation production and recreation. Um, and I think that architecture's task is less the representation of character and meaning. Uh, I don't think these are primary tasks any longer because we, are, we have available to us uh, a, a vast range of conventions, of norms, um, of things that are already made. But I think that architecture should deal with the, with the issue of self-evidence, the self-evidence of programs, the, the self-evidence of uh, a building's program through conventional elements. Um, and I think in its best form, um, that's a very personal view, architecture's task could also be to engage users and visitors to reflect on the raison d'etre of both the edifice as well as the society that gave rise to it. So an architecture of reflection is, I don't think, primarily emotional. Uh, I, that is the problem of the, the, the Gesamtkunstwerk, but contemplative. Um, and uh, <laughs> It requires constant redefinition. I think architecture can constantly redefine basic and actual needs through basic and actual buildings. So my criteria for selection have been um, edifices that address basic and social, uh, basic social and cultural needs uh, that show the critical transformation of patterns of use that use continuously revalued conventional elements, that in the broadest sense are complementary to the activities contained in them, that use as far as possible constructional systems and materials in such a way as to reveal the mode of construction and the tectonic logic, that constitute more than they represent. That is to say, they are what they are, rather than pretend what they're not. That edifices that try to re-establish the factuality of architecture as a constituent dimension of a society and culture. So those are the, some of the, the issues that I think uh, uh, have sort of interested me over, over many years. And I think that I, I would like to offer to you the kind of range of possibilities uh, within which I think these things um, uh, have manifested themselves in the way that perhaps I've seen them. And they are from uh, the three ranges, they're all fairly broad, um, from the first being a precise frame or vessel, uh, the second being uh, background, architecture as background, and the third, uh, an architecture of reflection. So um, the first um, example, perhaps we can have the slides um, here. The precise frame <coughs> or vessel. I mean, the precise frame or vessel uh, should be large enough to contain, uh, 
to to contain expected uh, activities and quite possibly the unexpected activities. Uh, the elements of the frame and the vessel are conventional and laconic and yet explicit about their constitution and tectonic composition. Um, there are a number of examples that I, I'd like to give. I don't think they're necessarily um, stylistically quote-unquote coherent, but um, I, I, I wish to offer these to you. Uh, the first one being on your right, the New National Gallery in Berlin, um, which clearly is a frame as a container that can contain a number of uh, activities. Uh, it belongs, if, if you like, to um, the tradition of strict orders, strict classicism. Uh, whereas the other one on the left, uh, the First Unitarian Church, Rochester, um, 59 to 67, um, tries to make a, a link to uh, ruins, to archaic volumes, uh, while also containing in its central volume um, the kind of activities that are possible. Um, on your right, I think for 1910-1911, a house in Hellerau, a part of a terrace uh, of houses, I think this refers to the kind of essential, normal, even ontological, if you like. And the one on the, r on the left is a restaurant. Uh, on the Philopapu uh, in Athens, 51 to 57, which I think, uh, for me, refers to the archetypal and vernacular. Um, and more recently, we have on the right um, a house for an art collector in Terville, Switzerland. This is 85 to 86 which in a way refers to its sur suburban surroundings by being a kind of pitched roof house that sits almost kind of demonstratively on a retaining wall. Uh, it looks fairly normal, but the way that it, the composition uh, has been made removes it from that normality and it becomes a kind of abstraction of the suburban types. And on the left, we have a, a headquarters for an insurance company in Basel, 1989-1993, uh, uh, which I'm afraid doesn't quite show everything very clearly, but it consists of two volumes, one taller and one at the front, and makes references to volumes that project, volumes that are lower, and another one of the Kunstmuseum that's opposite. So, um, on, on the one hand, it is what it is on its own, but on the other hand, it also makes a link to the context. Now, the second category um, on the range of possible um, phenomena that uh, are part of this criteria uh, for selection <coughs> Uh, this background architecture. Here we have um, an antiquarian bookshop in Vienna, 1973-79, and this is the front room, and that's the rear room. There's a series. There are a series of rooms, um, and if one were to enter space like this, you wouldn't really think that ha it had been designed. It, in a way, is part of um, a long Anglo-Saxon tradition, which has its roots in landscape theory of a kind of uh, natural nature, of a kind of um, something as it is without uh, human intervention or with hardly kind of conscious design intervention, but everything here has been designed from the floor to the, the kind of apparent casual piling up of um, bookcases. Uh, and of course that can be discussed in, in a kind of fundamental contra contradiction to 
what is background and what is actually man-made. But I think the, the key um, principle that motivated this architect uh, is the one that architecture is not life, architecture is background. Everything else is not architecture. Now, um, as part of a kind of important um, critique of the modern movement, one recognizes um, here the polemic that this architect, Viennese architect, has uh, proposed. Uh, he's, he shows here on the right a chair that once was a symbol of modern interiors, um, only two thirds of its size uh, are, it, are, are needed for the chair as such. The rest is decoration. Um, on the left-hand slide, you have Bauhaus handles. Uh, they all have geometric uh, basic forms. They're very, they're very uh, simple, in inverted commas, but uh, hardly suitable for the use by hand as handles. <coughs> handles for the same function as they look normally and as industry produces them. They fulfill a function, but nobody would call them functionalist. And um, we have here an interior on the, on the right that I think anybody would recognize if, you know, in the kind of uh, Central European um, cultural domain would kind of recognize as perhaps one's aunt's or uncle, uncle's uh, apartment. Um, it actually happens to be designed by the same architect. Every single piece is designed by the same architect, but it's deliberately uh, a compilation of apparent, you know, haphazard, but yet um, kind of independent pieces. Um, and on the left, a proposal by the same architect for a slum clearance project in uh, New York uh, during the war, during the Second World War, which uh, tries to establish both a perimeter uh, block definition while at the same time embracing the idea of uh, the ville radieuse. Well, um, perhaps that as a polemic is too much for some people, um, preferring instead to see the, the hand of the, uh, uh, the author. Uh, I think one, one particular experience that I've had personally of an architecture of re reflection um, has been visiting this, this one here, the Salk Institute. Um, and I think what it achieves is a kind of gradual opening of uh, the users and visitors' uh, inner eye to issues of existence. Um, this is the approach from the car park here on the right you are standing in front of the courtyard with the orange uh, trees on the, uh, in front of you. And that's the central space, um, which I think, in a way, I mean, it doesn't require any kind of explanation. And when one stands here, or when one stands at a landing in between, in, in the staircase towers, in between the studies and the main laboratory spaces. There's always a kind of uh, reference to not just the landscape, not just the context, but the broader context within which a biological institute works. I think it's, um, a similar um, quality is, is uh, contained in this particular building, St. Mark, a church in Björkhagen in Stockholm. This is 5662. The Salk Institute is 59 to 65. Um, and here we have a, the kind of paradox, which I think is an important aspect in, in this kind of work, between carefully composed real materials, clearly articulated tectonic elements, comprehensible configurations, 
but from a distance they're perceived uh, in a kind of a blurred, uh, abstracted way. Um, this here, Björkhagen, means birch uh, wood. And the brickwork is detailed with very wide mortar joints, and it's irregular uh, in, in a kind of mimetic way to the bark of the birch. I think this, this, uh, this paradox is essential to direct the users and visitors' um, attention away from the architecture towards the non-physical, uh, a process of intuition of the non-physical through the physical. Um, and this, uh, this landscape here uh, for the Malmö Eastern Cemetery which is part of a design that was won in a competition in 1916 and was developed un until um, the, the early 50s and 60s. <coughs> um, we see here the edges of the <coughs> cemetery. We see here, we look down from a ridge in the middle of the site towards one of the paths. And this is the, the competition winning scheme that um, Levens, Sigurd Levens produced, showing a kind of Palladian uh, structure, a series of um, little uh, containers, uh, so called Minislund um, area for memory, and this, this central ridge that runs along and divides the site into quarters and uh, a kind of open field. And if you look carefully, these quarters, the hedges that are suggested here, don't match up always. They, they're paired, but they don't match up with the joint lines. Um, and I wanted to show you this project uh, in a way to show the range and the development, not just of one architect, but as a, as a kind of representation of uh, how a number of architects worked through that period. This is uh, the preliminary design for the chapels of St. Uh, Gertrude and St. Knut, and it shows uh, uh, clearly a neoclassical uh, composition of conical volumes standing on a square base. Uh, this is what it looks like today, um, at least the landscape. You have a series of trees which subdivide uh, and articulate the quarters. And this is the central path here that leads uh, to the other end of the site. And St. Knut and St. Gertrude chapels are on the side. That was the belfry that was built uh, in the, uh, the mid-40s. And you see a ridge of wheat. Uh, this ridge of wheat, which you see also here in this photograph on the right, is something that uh, is part of the landscape design. Uh, Malmö is in a kind of agricultural uh, context, and the, the wheat expresses uh, the idea of the circularity of life, that it gets cut down uh, with the harvest season. It gets sown uh, in spring. In the chapel uh, of St. Gertrude, there is a kind of naive painting of um, farmers uh, reaping uh, wheat. And so there's a kind of analogy being made through the landscape of life as a kind of continuous uh, phenomenon, irrespective of the death of an individual. Um, the architect, when he died, had his ashes uh, thrown across the, bank, uh, the ridge of wheat. Um, and this is what it looks like today, the two chapels. Uh, one approaches the, the two porticos that are approached through now very mature trees. You can barely see one portico here. Uh, amongst the trees. And I just want to briefly outline 
uh, how difficult it was for this architect to uh, reach the design that he ultimately did. It is and it was a logical process, a process of stripping, a process of identifying the essential things. In a way, uh, coming back to uh, one of the tasks I think that architecture has to identify um, essential things. Um, here you see the uh, one version with two conical uh, chimneys in a kind of series of uh, funeral monuments. And on the left hand slide you see uh, in the 30s a design to strip everything to render the, the building as a kind of quasi uh, functional functionalist building but nevertheless there's an ambivalence by the architect expressed in the fact that the top model shows two chimneys and the bottom one shows just one and it, in fact it's not so much an ambivalence but the way that the project was carried out there was only money for one um, um, chamber um, while the other was uh, supposedly built uh, to be built in a second phase. Uh, but we see what actually happens is um, this as a project doesn't quite get built the way uh, there's not, not a conical tower but a square based tower um, and that is initially what uh, is, uh, has to satisfy the functions. Um, in the 30s then Levens redesigns and uh, fundamentally alters the design um, he doesn't abandon the reference to uh, architectural history but is able to find a kind of uh, series of compartments, volumes, uh, handling of material, a kind of technique of um, simplifying the references that he likes to make in such a way that uh, it becomes an architecture that is part of his own making <coughs> while using very basic uh, elements such as vertical walls, pillars, sloping roofs. Uh, so what we, s what we saw originally in the first phase here um, as the uh, initial core of the cemetery is now amplified by two chapels, St. Knut and St. Gertrude, with two porticos in front, waiting rooms in between, this is all the kind of uh, the rest of the uh, uh, cool storages and another chapel here with toilets at the back for uh, the mourners. Uh, a perspective study on the right showing uh, an interest in um, modulating the landscape so that you are also able to use the exterior um, for services. You can also open up in other words, um, using the site in front of it. And a photograph on the left showing how it was when it was first completed. So you have, in fact, a differentiated uh, set of roofs which, in a way, echo the section on the inside from kind of relatively low part at the front and a high part at the back. And just a few uh, images to show the integration of architecture with landscape, um, the way that the trees uh, are aligned with the uh, pillars, and the way that the canopy of the trees uh, aligns in a way with the canopy of the building. Um, detail uh, on the right and close up of the exterior of the waiting room. Uh, look into the waiting room and inside the waiting room and you begin to understand that he's trying to uh, set up similar relationships between the inside of the waiting room as the portico to the landscape um, so that you feel that you are in fact part of the exterior when you sit in there though certainly contained. Um, a detail of the waiting room here on the right a little fountain uh, and on the left uh, the interior of St. Knut with the uh, naive 
depiction of uh, harvest. Um, the small, this is the side of the building uh, with the, on the left, the small funeral chapel and the interior. And this is a view from uh, the men's bathroom out. There's this glass block, um, stacked uh, glass block. In fact, it was very difficult to take, uh, I would have liked to have taken a photograph from the individual cubicles because the cubicles are all screened by glass, frosted glass screen. So the light does come through, um, even though it's very dim, it does come through to the furthest cubicle. <coughs> and just some uh, close-ups of both the landscape elements as well as the uh, marble cladding of uh, the seconds that were used, um, found by Levelance from a marble um, quarry and reused in this, uh, what I call a kind of painterly way, a, a way that you don't actually perceive any uh, underlying pattern, but clearly there is a pattern. Um, in the same way as the, the trees have been pruned to form a kind of very rich um, woven texture. Uh, the, the functionalist chapel uh, was redecorated. This is the new front which shows a window for the organist and uh, the wooden screen with, very ti with tiny uh, openings, glazed openings. Um, and this is a view from the inside back towards the entrance and uh, a view showing his interest in um, very simple glazing techniques. Well, I said uh, that it, this whole project took him 53 years. Uh, he won the competition in 1916 and he finished a work um, in 1969, 1970 with this flower shop, which was also one of his last projects. He was, he was born um, 1885 and died 1975, 90, 90 years old. Um, and we had seen the ridge of wheat here in, in, a, in a former slide. This shows the location of the flower shop. Um, it's made out of cast in situ concrete with a copper roof and um, glass windows. This is the door that makes reference to the kind of uh, local uh, farmyards, uh, the way that they apply doors. And the interior as it was, with uh, again, kind of relatively irregular set of tiles and relatively irregular uh, light fittings, um, in a way alluding to uh, plant forms, ivy. The ceiling to this, uh, this <coughs> flower shop is just um, unfinished uh, insulation with, that has an aluminium um, sheet underneath it. And you can see that the photograph here on the right shows the eye level of a person coming inside. Uh, you're actually above the eye level. And I think this building is significant because um, of its fact of recording the Second World War, um, and the way that um, that record was dealt with by an architect um, in face of um, attempts to simply renovate and reconstruct the entire thing in its original form. So in 1944, this building was bombed. Um, and you can see the result on the left. And the first studies that uh, uh, Hans Dergas did was uh, in 1946. You can see the kind of question mark, as it were. What should we do with the area in between? Um, and I think, again, I, I can't go into the, the lengthy process, the numerous committee meetings, the fights with politicians that this architect had to go through in order to achieve uh, what I think this building uh, 
well, has achieved. Um, it's a process that lasts for 12 years, 12 to 13 years, but it doesn't end in 1957. It goes on up to 1975. And indeed, still there are people in uh, Bavaria who'd rather see um, this building completely renovated. Uh, this was an interim stage, the securing of a roof that wasn't there, that didn't exist, uh, by putting a series of steel columns and a timber construction to cover that gap and to gradually reconstruct an inner skin behind the original south-facing lodger. Um, we have here an attempt to specify a new staircase, whereas in the previous version, it was here, in this corner. Um, Dergast decides to reorganize the building so that it, in a way, becomes more logical, or in a way that you approach it uh, on its um, large axis. But the staircase that was finally built wasn't exactly the way he had foreseen it. Here's a contemporary view. Um, showing the dialogue that uh, the reconstruction has with the old. You see expressed brickwork in contrast to moldings, uh, molded stonework, and you see a kind of uh, equivalence of structure between this kind of um, the ornamental order and the factual uh, structure. Um, this was on the left, uh, the way that Dergas wanted the staircase. Uh, adhering to one side of the wall, <coughs> leaving gap so that these uh, piers would be set free, uh, allowing for a gallery to run across at the upper level. The clients didn't like that and they wanted a more monumental uh, solution. Um, Dergas wanted a simple barrel vault that continued <coughs> across the central axis of the whole building uh, as expressed here. And here we see some kind of attempts to um, test out the, the effects of uh, materials. Instead of repainting the whole interior with kind of polychromatic decoration, um, it was agreed to, to leave the ceiling white but instead of uh, reading, making it read as a kind of simple barrel vault, the clients insisted on this hipped version. Um, and they, didn't, they wanted cornices, um, which Dergas didn't want initially. So the issue of conservation uh, and reconstruction, the notion of um, the memory of the past that was conserved in the reconstruction of Dergas's work, I think it's um, very important um, not to erase the traces of history. Um, Dergas, shortly before he died in uh, 1975, said that the reconstruction of the Alte Pinakothek is, and despite all the problems, is and will be the most satisfying <coughs> task of my life. Um, building number three is really not only just one building, as I think building number one wasn't exactly just one building. It's a series of buildings in um, uh, former estate um, in Portugal. And it brings up, again, another uh, parallel example in the field of landscape, how architects can deal with um, landscape, uh, opening up a disused estate to public use. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the Quinta Conceição, which is this area here. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Caesar's swimming pool, which is over here. 
It's right on top of a hill. Um, and Fernando Tavara, his mentor, and the person who actually gave him this commission, uh, undertook to reorganize entries, uh, staircases, edges, uh, terraces, um, and a pool area, which is here. And I'll show you that in the sequence of slides. This is um, 1956 to 1959, and this element is this one here. We're looking from below up those steps. It's a courtyard that uh, organizes entry. And the colors which are taken from Portuguese farm farms, uh, from the vernacular, in its kind of very stripped and simple form, uh, is a parallel to Baragan's uh, architecture. Um, Tavara was not aware of uh, Baragan when he did this in the, the mid-50s. Um, here's some, well, some steps, another view into the courtyard. Um, re reusing some of the pieces that were found within this state, integrating it with a series of uh, ponds or um, water uh, elements. And the building that I'd like to talk about uh, is the um, tennis pavilion. Here's approach from that red courtyard that you saw, the lateral approach and a view inside, tiled floor, uh, concrete walls, uh, timber roof with a concrete beam. Um, Timber bar, uh, as seen from the front, uh, a concrete um, parapet. And I think this building um, fuses, synthesizes influences of, of the style of Japanese architecture of Portuguese vernacular. And yet in itself, it's in a way a kind of coherent piece. Um, the fourth building is um, a house. And while I'm a little reluctant about um, in single family houses, I think it is an important laboratory example, shall we say, for an architect to develop some of his or her own thoughts about architecture. Um, and I think one, one might argue that the Escherich House by Louis Kahn um, of 1959 61 is such an example of a piece of architecture that in a way transformed his view or crystallized his view of the kind of architecture that he wanted to make. We saw the Rochester uh, church, uh, and this is one of the original schemes, a uh, sketch scheme, um, and states thematically his interest in centralized volumes with appendages uh, on the perimeter, something that in a way you can also identify in the Salk Institute. He tries this um, ideogram, if you like, in a preliminary sketch for the Escherich House, here by suggesting a centralized volume with somehow accommodated service volumes, fireplace, the staircase running this way, and uh, two porches that are kind of uh, volumes attached. Um, but that plan he uh, overcomes in a way by rereading the drawing um, by saying instead of having a kind of unified square what we will have is a series of uh, elements that establish an A, B, A, C pattern putting the staircase crossways using the depth of the facade for bookcases for the opening of windows um, and such things and thereby by stating this difference between 
um, service, uh, service spaces and s uh, served spaces, a theme that he develops in his architecture. He's able to overcome this, uh, the problem of the freedom, as I see it, of the domino house by, in a way, giving a rhythmic structure to a volume and thereby articulating it on the exterior. I think that uh, the kind of notion of the ABAB um, comes up in a number of his projects and we saw already um, Ken Franklin's presentation of um, the Kimball. But I think, and here is this uh, photographer's sleight of hand, uh, there is actually that other volume over here which isn't so, um, doesn't allow you to see this building as a kind of simplistic centralized volume as uh, it is presented in this photograph. Oh, this is the wrong way around. Could we, could you just change the slides? Um, the fifth building is um, a building for assembly. It's the Philharmonie in Berlin, and we see it here in its kind of panoramic context uh, with the state library that uh, Hermann Herzberger presented, uh, the new National Gallery that we saw already, and these, these are actually contiguous images with the main uh, east-west street leading to the Brandenburg Gate and the uh, Reichstag looking towards the east here. The Philharmonie was, uh, was a commission that Sharon won as a result of a competition for another site. Uh, there was, in the mid-50s, a discussion about, there, wa there was no wall as yet, that the wall was built in 1961. Berlin was subdivided into four zones, military zones, of which um, <coughs> Um, the western part, uh, the people living there never wanted to give up the idea of a unified city. Uh, and they decided uh, in the early 50s to um, set up a kind of cultural forum. It's called a cultural forum, close to the border, close to the demarcation zone, as a kind of both a provocation, I think, uh, as much as kind of attempt to suggest that un a unified Berlin would still be possible. Um, so, when one sees it in this particular con uh, in this particular image, I think it's quite clear uh, that it's a freestanding building. But as I think Hermann has already pointed out, uh, for the State Library, there was a conception of uh, urban design involved that saw a city no, not, no longer as a series of perimeter blocks um, with streets and squares in between, but as a, a Stadtlandschaft, as a city landscape. And the notion of uh, the building um, as a series of terraces, uh, as we will see in a moment, uh, was quite evident of this city conception, urban conception. The other uh, aspect I think that is very important is the deliberate choice of site um, in the famous uh, plan for Berlin developed by Albert Speer uh, where the Brandenburg Gate is here, the, the Imperial, uh, the Reichstag is here. Um, this would have been uh, the headquarters for the army and on this very site, um, 
It was decided to put this um, Philharmonie, the concert hall. In fact, one could argue that the ghost of uh, Nazi planning was trying to be exercised by the um, new provision of the cultural forum. Just to remind you of the scale of the planning, um, that up there, I can't reach. <laughs> this here is the headquarters of the army, which is the, the space taken up by uh, the Philharmonie. And this is the South Railway Station here. Yeah. Tempelhof Airport is there, and that's that major axis, which uh, ended, was to have ended up in the dome, or the Congress Hall for 2,000 people. Um, yeah, just uh, to remind you that this is the Reichstag here, the building that we saw in the panorama. This is the Brandenburg Gate. And this is the corner of the uh, headquarters for the army. Well, enough of that. I think um, in one of the f first sketches that Sharon did, I think you can see very clearly the concept of a series of terraces, terraces as, as he called them, uh, vineyards, uh, covered in a kind of tent-like structure. Um, and the plan, the principal plan of the main auditorium uh, arrangement of those terraces, a sequence or series of grouped seats around uh, distinct um, so-called vineyards, and the location of the orchestra with seating for um, the audience at the back as well. So the notion of the music <coughs> center of activity um, was the key concept behind the planning of this. Um, the ground floor plan, entrance from the bottom, and those people who have tickets uh, who sit on the uh, left-hand side on the, should we say, on, on this part of the auditorium, go up this way. People who sit on the other side leave their coats along here and walk underneath the volume up those steps and emerge on a series of uh, landings in order to gain access to their seats. Um, it's impossible to do justice to the building by a series of a few slides, and I think those who've been, I think, will appreciate some of the qualities and perhaps also problems that this building has. I don't wish to deny that it's um, a building that to some people cause, causes some confusion. Uh, I've always found it a very clear um, example of how you can structure movement without hitting somebody on the head by axial, uh, axial directions. Here's a kind of uh, view of the partial view of the exterior with the new cladding that was put, put on. And here are just some views of the interior. Uh, it looks more chaotic than it is. Um, you have to experience it for yourself. I think it's, that's the only way you can understand this building. The quality certainly that it has when you uh, emerge from one of the landings and face one of the doors that leads you to your seating area is, I think, quite a remarkable thing that you, you have a view directly through here and you sense the volume of the space through those sets of doors. And I think the significance of this building is very much um, has to be seen in the context of German um, history, German recent history. Uh, there was a fear of the authoritarian figure, um, and there was an attempt to allow or provide kind of security for the individual within the group, rather than 
uh, allowing the individual to disappear in the kind of mass. So that's why uh, one has to, you know, in that sense, one understands these groups of uh, seats. It's not a kind of individualization. Um, it's not the return to the, <coughs> to the kind of family box uh, as, as the operas of the 19th century, but it's a group of people more than the size of a normal family. Well, building number six, which again is not really just one building, but it's uh, three buildings, shows how architecture uh, can be involved in the changing nature of a city. Uh, the city is Stockholm, and the changing nature in the last 50s, uh, 50, uh, since the 50s and 60s, has been the same story for all cities. The influence of the car, um, the, the development of the economy, and uh, the changing aspects of democracy. And for these aspects, uh, including the kind of requirement for um, more cultural facilities. A competition was held in the mid-60s to reorganize this area of Stockholm at the, at the top uh, there, <coughs> more clearly seen here. This used to be um, a series of uh, palazzis uh, uh, related to the royal palace and it was gradually taken over by uh, minist ministries. <coughs> so that by the mid 50s, um, all of that area was really just um, a center for bureaucracy. The central bank got too large, it needed to move, and uh, there was to be a new provision for theater. So the site for the competition was this area here. And it somehow had to mediate between the small grain, or the relatively small grain of that, and the larger 20th century streets that were being cut in Stockholm, and the kind of provision of uh, high-rise buildings that were built in the 50s uh, and early 60s, of which you see uh, just some of them, the, the feet of them, at the top of the slide. And while... <coughs> Peter Selsing, the architect of uh, the winning competition, um, very much understood the pressures that a city such as Stockholm was under in order to conform to kind of modern development. He was also highly critical of um, this, the attitude that was taken by the planners at the time, trying to uh, force new streets through a kind of grown city fabric uh, by, and also separating pedestrian from vehicular um, traffic as it still goes on uh, in, in terms of the development now in Stockholm where there are enormous sets of tunnels um, which are not unlike the things that are being done to many other cities such as Paris as we saw uh, in Hans van Dijk's example. So, Selsing takes the attitude of saying, okay, um, what we would like to maintain is some sense of this belonging still to uh, one kind of grain. He puts the central bank in a cubic uh, palazzo volume, the theater as part of the fabric of this in here, and the cultural center along the south side of the square, the Sergelstoy, um, as it were, like a wall, which is completely glazed on one side, on the north, uh, saying almost, this is as far as you are allowed to go to the planets. So the scheme here, shown in axonometric on the right and the plan on the left, uh, I think outlines very clearly um, an idea for a large piece of infrastructure, cantilevering um, beams glazed at the front, elevators linking to the pedestrian forecourt, um, a series of different volumes and activities um, 
were to take place in here, this being the theater and that being the central bank. In a way, buildings, three buildings, in dialogue with each other, or in trialogue with each other, making a piece of the city, uh, re-establishing a kind of memory for what <coughs> was there previously. That is the building that stood there uh, until uh, 60, 60, well, the, the late 60s. It's the central post office uh, telegraph uh, building. And you see in the other slide on the left, the volume that replaced it, um, a similar, almost of a similar uh, makeup, but quite distinct in the actual uh, exterior uh, form, uh, cladding. This is 1965 to 1976. And if we remember that in 1966, Aldo Rossi publishes the architecture of the city, um, in 1965, in other words, when the competition was adjudicated, Selsing was actually designing something that related to this idea of um, the, should we say, phenomenal um, parallels to a city wall, a palazzo, and a piece of fabric. Uh, There's a close-up of the bank um, with the granite that, uh, that clads it, and a detail of the plan as it was actually carried out. I won't go into the complication of uh, the fact that it was used as, as a parliament for a few years, um, because it doesn't alter the, the conception of the buildings. Um, here's a close-up of some of the details on the inside, and a section through the bank showing obviously the vault, uh, the, the main office levels, and the social facilities that exist at the top. There are a couple of saunas, uh, badminton court, um, table tennis, um, and a swimming pool to be used by the people who work there. Now this is the other uh, building, the cultural center, and I think you can you can understand here a kind of sketch, and a, a kind of naive sketch, if you like, of how he saw the activities being projected on the glass screen at night, like a kind of piece of sheet music uh, depicting the, the, the things that go on. And in a way, his heroes, Giacometti and Peter Weiss, um, in a way, demonstrated. But I think what is also quite interesting in the, the development of this is the stepping back, the revealing of the structure, the, the kind of display of the uh, rear, um, something that opens up uh, the reading, the kind of uh, very literal transparency. Now, this competition being uh, held in 65, 64, as a cultural center, it predates the Pompidou. Uh, the person who wrote the brief, Pontus Hurten, then became the director of the Pompidou a few years later. And the concept of something that is um, a serviced uh, volume, a linear serviced volume from the rear that has different uh, volumes on the inside, allowing different kinds of activities uh, with the art uh, exhibition on the top floor, with a library at ground floor. All this kind of program was already contained in this building. Though it has none of the technological rhetoric um, that I think the Pompidou has. Now, going from the, from the uh, enormous scheme to a very small scheme, my seventh uh, building it's not really a building again, it's uh, an interior. Um, and it, I think it's a, way, it's, it's a pity in a way to, to uh, present it in this manner um, by focusing so much attention on it because it doesn't, it doesn't want it. Uh, it's conceived as something that is just itself, uh, as if it had been there all the time 
um, as if no architect had designed it. This is the plan here on the right and the section through the, on the left. The task was to connect two volumes um, and to make it use as a cafe. Um, the floors are at different levels and the architect, Hermann Schech, makes use of the fact of this difference by having people seated here and allowing people to stand there so that you have an equivalence in height um, of people's uh, eye level. Well, that's not the only quality that it has. Uh, it makes use of or makes use of reused uh, tombstones. Uh, it makes use of reused tiles as if they were just a series of um, uh, functions that had occurred in it. Um, and this is the interior. You see the tiles, you see the sofas on the side and the mirrored uh, side walls, which clearly make a reference to uh, Adolf Loos Kantner Bar, but with a difference, uh, Kantner Bar, the mirrors are above head height. Here they are actually at head height. But in order to um, avoid the kind of infuriating problem of uh, reflection and not being able to see yourself, um, no. the, the walls of the building, uh, of, the build, of this room, aren't parallel. So you, the reflection that you get is a curving reflection. So you can see yourself. Um, in the mirrors. And later on in 1979, or I think, yeah, not even later, um, Czech was given what he calls the largest commission in his life, which is the provision of uh, these toilets to, um, to this thing. And on the left you see an example of how he deals with these two wash basins. <clears throat> now, oh, um, I think I'm slightly out of sequence on the other one. When we talk about background, um, I think the best example for Czech's work is uh, the collaboration with the painter Christian Ludwig Attersee on the carpet for another restaurant that he did. Um, as you can see, I mean, unfortunately, this is not in color. This carpet shows, if you like, bits of food, cake, plums, fruit, etc. Um, and they are, if you don't really pay attention to it, they sort of blur, they, they escape your attention. If you don't actually look at the carpet, in fact, the carpet takes on a color of kind of a brownie gray, even though the the base color might be blue, and there might be yellow, red, etc. in it. The reason for this, and it's been very carefully calculated, is, and I must say also that there are two car or three carpets of identical pattern, but with different basic colors, like green, red, and uh, blue. But they all have the same effect, the visual effect, when you don't look at them. Uh, the color that they assume is a kind of brownie gray. Um, and this, in a way, comes out of, you know, uh, knowledge out of uh, color theory and so on. The basic intention is that uh, the blurred color that it results in is equivalent to the Austrian norm for dirt, um, the standard for dirt color. So if any food really gets trodden into the carpet, you don't notice it at all. It really literally blurs into the background. And I think this is a kind of indication of the thinking um, that is behind this. Um, building number eight, again, is not really one building, but a whole estate. Uh, and is um, a project that went on and is still going on since the late 70s. Um, it recognizes the, the pressure that is on certain agricultural towns. Uh, this is Evora in the south of Portugal. 
to expand and to provide uh, residences for people who migrate to it. Um, I think it's significant for the way that it integrates not, um, not only the kind of development that exists uh, emerging from the city as disparate as some of these pieces are, uh, it also integrates the topography, some uh, illegal housing here, um, and provides a kind of backbone that in the future will be the main shopping area. This is uh, on the right, an aerial view from the old Quinta, from the old estate. This project was the Quinta Malagueira um, by Alvaro Siza. And I think the other thing that one can recognize quite um, clearly is the reference that Caesar makes to the context. The context in the closest sense to Evra's aqueducts, Roman aqueducts, the way that they distribute water services, to the close by um, housing uh, of the Algarve, which shows cobbled streets, whitewashed walls, some courtyards. Um, in these smaller schemes here, and then more diverse development in other instances. But uh, Caesar's scheme re-establishes, in a way, some of these, but also brings in new elements that are clearly known from 20th century architecture, the architecture of uh, the 20s and 30s. So you see courtyards, um, terraces, uh, the service duct uh, on the left. And I think what is a very interesting research in the typology of plans and spaces and volumes, buildings that are able to grow, that can accommodate different sizes of units, uh, that can expand and in a way absorb increasing families, sizes and families. Uh, and it's not a hell-bent hell uh, attitude on inventing new solutions, but in a way, these are new solutions. It's looking very closely at what exists and transforming that and making it work in such a way that you can have two, three, four, five bedroom houses. And the five bedroom houses are still reasonable. Now this is an, uh, obviously in an unfinished state, but I think when it's occupied, and there are alterations happening all the time, these buildings absorb these, you can see that it begins to have its life of its own. Building 9 is um, a leper's hospital for um, in India, in Lazur, in the province of Maharashtra. It's about 400 kilometers um, northeast of Bombay and sits in this plain close to um, more, well, a kind of more wild uh, vegetation to the north. Lazur village is here. And in this neighborhood, on this area, there are about uh, three or four thousand lepers. Um, the, the architects who uh, designed this building, one of them was born in India and uh, actually lives in Norway now, was called to work um, for an uncle of his who uh, is a missionary and has been in India for uh, over 30 years, together with his wife, who's been there over 50 years. And the idea behind this um, building is essentially to provide shelter against climatic, um, well, against climate, against, clearly against neglect of the lepers themselves, against uh, shelter against thieves and uh, wild animals. And so it's a rect rectangle with, uh, conceived as an oasis with trees in the middle and uh, <coughs> a carp pond. Uh, 
Um, that's the plan. What we have is the administration at this end. Uh, some of the wards in here, more wards there. Men's wards and women's wards here. Women's wards here and here, men's wards here. This is the carp pond. This is the bathhouse. These are toilets here. Um, and there is a prayer room here with a chapel. Um, and two water towers, a car park. Um, the architects, when they went there, um, <coughs> were in their early 20s. This is 1983 uh, to 85. Uh, it's a building that's made out of uh, stone on the outside and brick on the inside. It has a 45 centimeter wall, 22 centimeter vaulted roof that is tiled, and the tiles are in above the inhabited areas are white, above the non-inhabited areas are blue, so that it absorbs the roof is able to absorb uh, energy uh, that it gives off at night. And you can see the attention and the kind of um, detailing that has gone into uh, the building, even though the, the craftsmen um, are perhaps not as well trained as in um, Western civilization. Uh, here's the window to the nurse's room, uh, a detail of the elevation. Uh, one of the terraces between the wards overlooking uh, the plain and part of the dining room here. Uh, the bathhouse in front without the carp pond yet being filled and the drawings of the carp pond, uh, of the bathhouse. Could I have the... Yeah, and just two more details of the windows, um, which show both kind of refined and roughness at the same time. My last example is from Switzerland, is um, a sculpture gallery <coughs> for an artist, uh, for, well, for a single sculptor. Um, it sits in a valley and it's a long building that is aligned with the valley and is kind of seen as a part of um, the development that's gone on in this valley, which is both um, residential and, and, well, a village. Um, that's the view from the other side and the front door. Uh, that's the view from the first room out. Uh, I can't show you any more images of it, and I don't want to, because uh, the architect quite rightly insists that the building only makes sense with those reliefs and sculptures hanging in the space. Um, but I think what I can what I can show you is that these spaces are actually the spaces, there's no finishing to go on, this is the finished building. Um, <coughs> thresholds are clearly expressed, the layering of the construction uh, is clearly expressed. And it makes references to uh, a Romanesque church nearby, um, which again expresses its construction very clearly. Uh, in fact, is With these few openings, you actually get a very clear area that is lit, um, and it's just—it's almost like a kind of telescopic lighting. Uh, and the roof, I think, the quality of the lighting in that gallery will be similar, as well as I know this architect Peter Merkley. Uh, and I think here is an example of uh, one way of hanging a sculpture by this sculptor Josefsson in a private house in Winterthur. And it looks extremely 
dry, which it of course is, but if you, if you start to investigate this quite carefully, you understand that the floor has an outline, that the height, in a way, is carefully determined according to the location that this entrance space takes, the light, the way that the window is made, and the location it has, is considered in relation to the piece and the room itself. So, uh, that was my last example, and um, I would like to summarize very briefly um, some of the issues. I, I've chosen examples from different fields, um, different building tasks, but I think they're all in a way exemplary in their own field. Um, can I, I haven't, uh, there are still two more slides. Um, I think they, they in a way explain that uh, architectural work that is significant has been done, even if it's not in, you know, the kind of well-known cities, the metropolis of this world. Um, but they also indicate, I think, that work needs to be done. Um, and I think that if one may um, identify the direction that some of these pieces could be said to take, uh, they are, just to summarize, uh, the clarification of tasks and needs, and also what I believe to be um, the abstraction, the principle of abstraction in architecture. Now, I haven't talked about this in any way, but I think it's something which uh, interests me uh, very much. And it's... Uh, the works, in a way, bring an awareness uh, to the societies in which they're placed. As particularly this one here tries to show how much or how little is necessary uh, to achieve uh, an inner calm. Uh, I think architecture isn't about animation. Uh, it is about the dynamism of the continuity of life. Um, architecture is an extension of life, physically uh, and uh, in its own reason for being. Uh, I'll show you these two slides from the baptismal font uh, by uh, Peter Selsing in St. Thomas in Sweden, in Stockholm, outside Stockholm, which is a granite block that has a kind of half egg-shaped pool cut out and has ridges uh, ground in the side. And on a certain time of day, uh, the sun strikes it in the summer and the pool is lit up in this green color. And on the side, you have a kind of uh, water supply the water, the water is allowed to drip off the edge here. And I think it's things like this, without great invention, that um, to me mean more um, in architecture than any kind of curved roof or so-called deconstructivist uh, machinations. Thank you very much.
sum up uh, and uh, in the danger of making uh, a kind of academical discussions, uh, the precise frame, the vessel, which is uh, the instruments, the minimal instruments of, of architecture, the background, which seeks some kind of anonymity or, or a kind of absence, uh, and uh, the architecture of reflection, maybe you could also say an architecture of contemplation. Um, but in what you have shown, um, there is also a kind of uh, sensibility or maybe a sensibility with a kind of ethical uh, under, undertone which you could summarize with the words a, a, a noble poverty, a kind of vision of life which doesn't need materially very much resources or, but can be glorified or can be uh, um, can be uh, sublimated. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, that is what I my my first uh, reaction to to the image I saw. I, 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 I think I don't know if, if you can perhaps that's true of the later examples that I gave. The last two, yes. the Lepers Hospital and the uh, Sculpture Gallery. I think that uh, I think that there's a certain well, I mean, there's a certain validity to that di direction. I I would agree with that. Um, I don't see that as the only option. Mm. But I think you know, uh, that would that would interest me personally very much. You know, and it goes back to um, the modern project, if you like, that people like. Uh, Nice and so on also were interested in you know, the, the material itself, mm. the presentation of that itself. Now, he used on many occasions marble, which is not cheap. Um, but you know, I mean, there's that kind of interest in um, allowing things to speak in their own voice. In the world. Mm. It was interesting because in some of the uh, later examples you showed, I feel a kind of spirit which uh, you can <coughs> see in some of Louis Kahn's uh, buildings, in which the, I mean, can explain the, it, 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 the, the, the construction is identical to space, I and mean, the construction is the space. But, but the, the Kahn building you showed is, is, is one of the more rich buildings of Kahn, which is <coughs> more. In what sense do we in terms of material, or in terms of? What but it doesn't show that, that kind of uh, principle about uh, the uh, uh, identity between structure and, and space. I mean, it, it's more a kind of outside uh, space, which is... Uh, I think it's, well, I think it's about articulating uh, spaces on the inside as much as it is uh, about the problem of I mean, the making of the figure. But in a way, it didn't uh, show... I mean, it does have that aspect, I think, which the images you use don't really show. Yeah, I didn't have any interior. I mean, but you know, the, the color shop, you know, where you talked about the uh, photographer. Yeah. In a funny way, that, that photograph doesn't show the materiality of the building, no. which it has, no, has quite a material quality, in fact, with all the joints of the blocks yeah. and so on and so on. Yeah. Well, yes, there's something there, but it's not Again, the voice of the people. Again, voice of the people. I wanted to uh, maybe first a remark. I found it quite uh, interesting that lately, uh, yesterday was shown the, the cemetery of Aldo Rossi. Today you showed your cemetery and. Not my cemetery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Cemetery there, and uh, there's uh, also uh, lately a lot of publications about the cemetery it was built by Mirais uh, in uh, Spain. And uh, I was uh, quite uh, astonished, I think. Uh, it was quite long, long uh, ago when you showed it, then I was really almost angry. 
because I felt that uh, dealing with learnings, which I believe it's one of the most uh, uh, investigated subjects up of after the war, when in this uh, subject of cemetery, when you deal with the, the, the inhabitants are quiet and would not have complaints, but I do think that uh, Working on such a project for 50 years and what you mostly emphasized was the simple glazing and the tiles, that was also and which, which I think was done probably beautifully, but I think the architect uh, for, was not really uh, occupied for 50 years with simple glazing. I mean, it was really occupied with a subject. And what I felt a bit disappointed is that as an architect, as a critic, you didn't really, you did mention a little bit the, the relation to the landscape, but you mostly talked about the non sequence pattern or the laboratory was the, actually the only point that you re referred to, to the people who are coming to, to uh, actually the people who are dealing with, with, with an ungrasp. As, as a task for Levens who entered a number of competitions and won a few, <coughs> including the Woodland Cemetery, how he thought for almost his entire life about this problem and how he developed together with uh, another architect, Tosin Stubilius, the idea in one of the original um, com uh, exhibition schemes for the Berger Lieben Chapel in um, Helsingborg, the idea of a building that you visit where you don't enter and leave through the same door but you follow a sequence that is structured by a number of uh, events which are to do with um, Greek mythology as well as you know, contemporary uh, ideas or then contemporary in the uh, early 20th century and I think one, can, one could elaborate that uh, in the instance of this particular cemetery but I think that you know, there's so much in it. Uh, I just want to show you uh, that particular instance of the Wheat Ridge. Uh, I think you can go and see it for yourself and um, be much more, much more impressed than I could ever describe to you. you know? And I think the same applies to the Stock Institute, the same applies to a number of the other buildings that I've pointed to. And I, I think it's, you know, I. You may, uh, I mean, it, it may be a little patronizing to say you should go and visit it, but I think the only way to experience architecture is to visit it. So why are you talking about it? I've been asked, I've been asked to demonstrate. It's not a good enough reason. I mean, as a critic and somebody who's writing, I don't believe that that's all your, you don't deal with you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you can you can demand more from critics, and I think if you if you're patient enough, you can wait for a few months. There is an essay which will come out on on this. But you know, uh, um, but I mean, the, the this I mean, you know, end this discussion. I mean, I think what, what one thing that is also I think very interesting with almost no except well, there are. There's one exception, actually, which, which uh, I mean, just judging from this material, and I've never seen the Escher cast, but judging from the material, if I'm right, I mean, there's only one building which is the Escher cast that is actually not uh, very topographic. I mean, otherwise, almost all the examples uh, are very much uh, to do with landscape, you know, and are the, the way in which they um, generate their full uh, dimension depends very much on the landscape. And I think that in this particular sort of exchange, because uh, I've never seen the Malmo thing, and all I've ever, I've sort of ever sort of uh, absorbed is the flower shop sort of mm. through photographs. I mean, I, I, it was a big surprise to me to see what it really is, this thing. I, I never sort of somehow felt that. But something I know better, which I think does. Um, I mean, I think you're, I mean, I understand your defense, but still, I think if one takes Salk, for example, I mean, in, in some ways, I think you know the buildings too well because, um, I mean, one of the key things I, I've been to Salk twice, like eight years separates them, separates these two visits, 
And it is amazing how you can go to such a thing and see it, and then also at the same time not see it. I mean, I think that's also very, very interesting. And the second time I saw it, vis-a-vis -vis the question of the relationship between the building and the landscape, two things struck me very strongly. One is this use of the podium. First of all, the fact that the thing had, is on a podium. And the way the podium joins to the ground involves seams mm. or, 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 or sort of gutters, really, mm. that are also seams. And the, the strange thing is that it makes you think of Venice in some ways, because those gutter seams look as though one of their primary purposes is to drain stormwater. So they're not only joints, but they uh, are uh, for draining stormwater. And yet at the same time, you know it's California. All right, sometimes it may rain, but basically there's not much stormwater. <laughs> So there's a metaphor there about water that, that, that begins the whole story. And of course, you cannot miss the water discharging into the ocean, although you didn't uh, talk about it and you didn't mention it. And the first time I went there, of course, I got that and you got it also. But the second, if you start to get more, if you start to read the, the building more closely, for example, you discover um, like very interesting dimensions, the, the fact that I don't know how it was contrived, but the fountain system that is the source for the water, it makes a perfect converging uh, curve of three, consisting of three parts issuing from a square fountain, and the discharge is also a square water, and then the water runs in this channel. But before it hits the other discharge, it goes into holding tanks, and um, these holding tanks are also positioned in a certain way in relation to the whole stone system and so on. So, you know. And I realized that to do 10 buildings in a short time is uh, <laughs> difficult. But I think this question of those kind of, um, the, these kind of specific elements, which actually charge the work, you know, are, are very, very important in a way. Because, um, like for instance, you know, from your, if I, I'm very intrigued to go and see Malmo. But I'm also sort of at the same time, um, sort of, I don't quite know. I, I mean, I just have sort of the briefest kind of suggestion of what it might be, really. I don't have, I can't get hold of it, really, at the same time, you know. Whereas the sculptor studio, of course, is much, well, because of the, uh, there's also this kind of cryptic business that the uh, character work that you, you know, at the end of the slides, because you, you can't see the inner. Uh, sacred, in a sacred well, chamber of the temple. It doesn't but, have a roof but, at the moment. So well, but the whole thing doesn't have a roof, does it? At uh, the moment, but uh, it will have a roof. I see. Yeah. And that, that also gives a curious uh, feeling to it. Uh, so, uh, you're frustrated also. You don't no, no, well, uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> yes, a little bit. And I'm trying to push, though, more on, on uh, like, um, I'm trying to be, because I'm trying to articulate it the nature of this frustration, because I think it points well, to... Let me, let me, let me yeah. just, I mean, the way I see it, and the way that <coughs> it's, you know, it may sound as a, uh, like an incredibly linked excuse, but I think, um, you know, these things are there, the published plans, photographs, and so on. Um, and you can, you know, most people who read plans are able to, amongst architects, are able to discern something from them. You know, and they're, they can sort of reconstruct a few things for themselves. I think it is very important for people to experience things at first hand, whether it's the drawings or whether it's the thing itself. Now, obviously, um, you know, it's like raising a red rag to you know, kind of a bull uh, by showing some of these slides and not really talking about the way uh, that you expect it to be. But I think that there is a limit to how much one should say about these things. Thank you. Yeah, but in this age in which, you know, the, the stuff which is uh, more, I mean, given your position, which is this question, you know, to do with what uh, Hatz was talking about, which is this laconic, uh, noble, well, the word, the phrase was noble poverty and so on. I mean, uh, given the, the noise of the media, I mean, I understand the polemical position, but on the other hand, uh, if one leaves it like that, uh, the game is won by the noise because 
you know. But it's uh, it's it's uh, being one anyway. I think it's oh, the only one. The only no, it's <laughs> being one. <laughs> by that. <laughs> no, I think it is. <laughs> the only way can, <laughs> the only way you can do it is by talking in this way about some of the issues. Yes, but I. But the I issues I and and not necessarily about every single example and how it does it. The, the, the technique, the trick, the the sleight of hand. You know, the, the kind of compositional manner and so on. I think that is for people to discover, that is for people to uh, interiorize and, and reject, if you like, and to engage with when they visit. I think otherwise we, we again move into this, what I feel most, the formalism, you know, by, by saying, okay, these are the ten and they do things this way uh, and, you know, sure enough, in a few months' time you'll see things on drawing boards. And I, I think I, that, I, that concerns me a great deal. But I think if you talk about the, uh, um, you know, the, the way something is made, it, it's not so easy to just stick it onto a drawing. Yeah. Can I try to? Mm. I think this question of you has to do with the fact that, you know, in a way, Wilfred already showed some way to go, and then he left, I think, things open, which you, in a way, has to fill in yourself or by fisting it. I mean, I think it's very interesting that he didn't tell anything. Only by doing it in a certain way, pointing at certain things, very precise, it made you rather curious. Curious. curious, in a way. This is, I know, these are, are, these are two questions of curiosity about what it, it's more than what he's saying, in a way. But, but, but it, I think it deals with the way he talks about the subject. So he thought it was not complete, but anyway. Anyway, this is the mark. I have a remark. I want to play it. Yes? You? I am, I'm looking at you. I know how to Yes? Uh, I found your talk very valuable in, in the light of this whole week. We are exactly in the middle, I believe. And it opens up uh, territories that I, if nobody will object me saying so, have not been covered. By, by previous speakers, at least I, it's my opinion. Also, the wealth of slides uh, and, and feelings that you projected are, is a new contribution, as I understand it, to this week. There are three points I'd like to raise, if I may. Uh, you said, after in, in your introduction, uh, you spoke of the underlying set of values, and you asked for more differentiated ways of approaching. Uh, the problem of architects seeing the role. I, I believe you'll agree that these are some issues I raised yesterday uh, morning in my contribution. And uh, you said, zeitgeist, there's never been a uniform, unified style. Uh, I, at least that's what I thought. I don't, I, that I strongly disagree with. Just, just look at uh, Egypt. I mean, we can go on and on. I think if you look at the period of Shinko, you could very much speak of the unified style. So I'm very, well, anyway, throughout culture, primitive and advanced, thousands of years back, uh, there is, in my opinion, and in opinion of many historians, throughout, again and again, unified style. Now, on, on, on Malmo, of course, perhaps the most fascinating area that you raised, uh, the, the picture struck me very strong, where you showed trees combined with columns. And I believe you spoke rather improve, uh, provingly of the integration of these. Now, there, I think we come to the central problem facing this discussion, how architects, how individuals see the same object and respond to it. Because uh, here, I, could, I felt uh, quite different I, that to, to unity. I could see there is a contradiction between the nature of the tree and the character of this beton, it seemed. It seemed there was a struggle going on between these two elements. In a sense, the architect was forcing something uh, quite unnatural, and uh, uh, you know, one can respond with aggression. You speak approvingly of this phenomena, this uh, creation of an architect. I tended to sort of hold back and say, there's a force there, or negative, possibly evil. So I think this comes to the central point again, how we cannot, I suggest, in this dissonant society, find a unified response to either architecture or art. We cannot, and this is one of the principles of our, our situation. 
to try and get out of that by an individual critic or an individual artist saying, this is the way to see it, or this is the creation, I think that is no longer possible in principle, in our situation. Now I come to the final point, which struck me very deeply. Uh, I'm sure it did many of us. Your presentation of the Alte Pinotheek Munich. It was very, very moving, and it's actually new to me. I'd been there, but I hadn't seen Alte Pinotheek so far. Now, you said, said uh, I quote, not to raise trace of history that was earlier on, and then at, to Munich you said that it is important not to erase traces of the past. That is your comment on the approvingly of this architect. At this very moment, the whole of Germany was engaged in the attempt to obliterate, to a large extent, traces of the past, i.e. the Nazi past. Buildings were either destroyed or, or reconstructed, so as to any uh, symbol of swastika was systematically taken down. This started as soon as the war was over and went on for decades, is still going on. Now, a contradiction. No, you, I mean, I well, let me, let, excuse me, let me, I have, let me just finish this. So there, uh, is, so that's a very simplistic and illogical opposition of two different phenomena. On the one hand, you have the individual building, and on the other hand, you've got uh, a strategy of you know, denazification, which uh, hasn't been complete. You know, as you know yourself, in Nuremberg, those buildings are still there. You know, there are still relics of the past, which haven't been completely removed. So it hasn't been uh, 100%. And I think that you can't equate uh, the relationship or the kind of strategy towards one building uh, as, you know, as, as perhaps one of the few instances where, and it, and it, it's, it actually isn't because Delgas worked on a number of other reconstructions you know, in Munich that are of an equal uh, significance in my mind uh, in, in relation to restoration and you know, retaining the scars of war. So I think it's not quite fair, that statement, can you say something about your earlier remarks about if you still Well, I think, you know, you, you, you have the previous um, comments made. Made the observation that we should also look at the social and cultural context in which some of these phenomena are, uh, you know. And when you m mentioned the Egyptian, well, you know, I mean, the Egyptian period wasn't exactly the kind of highlight of democracy. And so I don't think that that is necessarily a good indication of, you know, stylistic unity within a kind of autocratic or, well, basically despotic regime. You know. So uh, I think we are talking about democracy, we are talking about uh, differentiation, the process of differentiation that I've tried to suggest to you, which is part of you know, the development of more singular individual positions. And I think that that is what I was referring to, not you know, the, the, you know, whether it was true or not, whether Egypt, Egypt during the period of the pharaohs was unified or not. I mean, I think that, that in itself is open to discussion because uh, when you look at books on sculpture, when you go and visit <coughs> Egypt, uh, there are all sorts of developments in architecture and sculpture which don't necessarily uh, suggest the uniformity of style. Excuse me, Egypt is an example I saw in because it's well known, I can go through primitive cultures where you find, and, but to come back to the, uh, I just wanted to point that a dogmatic statement like it is important not to erase traces of the past is not a valid statement uh, taken throughout in, in general. I'm not defending Nazi Germany or e Egyptian uh, whatever uh, repression. It's my, it's my statement of belief. It's not a statement of fact. It's my right. statement. Look, I'm only discussing, but finally, the DDR at this moment is erasing trace of the past. There is enormous controversy where left-wingers are objecting to the destruction. There's a whole campaign against the tearing down of social emblems, to some extent justified. So this issue is of great, great cultural importance, and we see it all over. And I'm not now defending, I'm not saying they shouldn't have torn down the Nazi evidence. I'm just raising it as a problem, as an issue. When you are speaking, I think you can ask Ignacy. You are also for a long time already. No, not anymore. Okay. Yeah. 
George. How much you, you, you may uh, give us the energy or the, the joy or the energy to go on in this? Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, on, the, on the objective of this week, which is to discover seminal works or canonical works. So, in, in, in a certain point, we may question this. Also, all these, these examples are extremely interesting and uh, exciting. We may uh, ask. Are they backside, interesting backside, or are they real seminar works? First? And secondly, it's, it's a problem of relate, uh, related to this uh, kind of frustration, which is not really a frustration in a negative term, but uh, asking for more, which is uh, a contrary of frustration, but rather you give us the envy and you, you stop immediately saying, well, you know, Salt Institute, well, you know, that, or, you know. You know, you know. Well, well, we don't know. I mean, personally, I don't know so much. And I think historian, not only you, but also uh, Van Dyck, underestimate a kind of banal. That's not banal because it's not uh, it's not banal, mal malheureusement. But could be very simple uh, way of systematically giving us the chance to understand the building. I mean, cut, uh, section, plan, uh, and scale are. Uh, in, it seems to me, in and because you wrote that paper, huh? you didn't talk too much about the representation of, which is the, the basic uh, topic of your uh, written, uh, interesting, very interesting uh, writing, is about this problem: how to translate this uh, energy, this uh, joy, this interest, you, which is largely shared by myself. So I think. When you read magazine, you are very much frustrated by the impossibility to understand something, very, because there is no scale, no, no possibility of comparison. I think a, a, good, a good entry in, in a very simple, at first step, simple, first step, uh, possibility to make your choice is just to, to be able to compare things. Is it? Uh, yeah, I, know, I, I accept that. I, I press it very much. I accept that. I, I would like to travel to Suez mm -hmm. now to see these people. So it's not a question of accept no, I accept, this tour. I accept uh, the, I, I mean, I accept, uh, you know, as a kind of in total, uh, mm -hmm. this, this issue of uh, presentation of the, the factual um, and, you know, the kind of reading of it, if you like. Um, but you, I, I, I think that, yeah, you know, that, that, that is, to what extent is how much of the factual presentation no. uh, begins to, no, anyway, Sorry, that was another one word. I was words. very gentle, and I, I, because I, I, I like your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like the way, but, but also, I must say, you have, vous avez mis, uh, you, you put the, the energy on the prolegomène, no? You describe the, the, the context, and when you arrive to the, and also Van Dyck was saying, well, you know, as a critic, we should be able to talk about colors, materials. Well, exactly, we would like that you, 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 you put more. I'm sure you are able, but it's something in the air of the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just to, I, I would like to continue because I think it's worth, um, because you see, I mean, I. I for instance, the Dolgas book, you know, which I, uh, I, I went to that Alta Pinica, knowing, not knowing what the hell I was going to see. I thought I was going to see the cleanser building and so on. I knew nothing about anything. And when I went in that axis, I was there a very short time, and suddenly I come to the staircase, you know, and I, and I just can't believe this staircase. I think I, I, I told you that. And then I also see the other side, and then I have to leave. And, and then you said uh, um, something that interested me about, well, first of all, I think there are two points. Apart from the issue of landscape, you mentioned, you mentioned two, I think very, in the end, I think it's a very polemical issue for you. The length of time that Leverance worked on this cemetery, and also the length of time that Dolgas worked on this building. Uh, you, you stress this, uh, you even also in, in, uh, in Everard, you say that you have the same, which is, these things are important, I think. And, 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 the, and then you talk about the conflict between the 
architect and the society, and about this question of these piers, which is also something I didn't know, that the, there was the idea to have a gap between the staircase and the piers, and then you know, it goes through. And then you, you, on the other side, you show these columns and this roof, and you, you also mentioned that this is a certain stage of its development. Now, I, if I, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I remember that I have this vague memory, maybe it's a, it's, um, it's a dream. That when I went the other side, I noticed two things about it. One, there were piers, but there were also rainwater, uh, these, these steel rain columns were still there, but there were rainwater downpipes. Mm -hmm. And there was this strange play between the rainwater downpipes mm -hmm. and the, these thin columns. Mm -hmm. All right, then it is a classical building, which is, uh, the, the morphology of which is somehow answered, right, by, by the, 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 the round brick arches and so on. But there is also a, a, a polemic on the part of Dolgas, which is a kind of uh, respect for, but also critique of classicism, mm -hmm. and a kind of uh, um, uh, involvement with vernacular as the base of classicism in some sense. You know. So all those things, it seems to me, including the, the struggle with the society, and, and also maybe the path where uh, the struggle with the society is contingent upon this, this kind of, these kinds of questions, are left, uh, are not, you know, are not uh, elaborated by you and I realizing there's this whole problem of ten buildings and so on and so on. But still, you know, one could go to that place even. And all right, then of course you have the experience of the building. But, you know, the, the, the story of the building, you know, also you could come away and never know that story, you know. Or, without working at it a lot, maybe you can't, I think, you, know, you know what I mean? You can't I, I feel think, the... I understand, you know, I understand. Um, yeah. say, say you've been living in Munich, for, for example, for some time, since you know, the mid-70s. You would be aware of the discussions that they are still trying to reconstruct that building you know, to its original version. And when you go there, you understand, even if you don't know anything of the history of you know, the, the, the con construction process, you, you, you as a citizen would have to discuss in your own mind whether it is valid or not valid to reconstruct. Now, in, against that background, uh, one can see the, the host of designs that Dogas made. But I think the other question that interests me is the, the kind of, um, yes, the recessive nature of the whole design in the end, um, that it has turned out to be, but also that it was intended to be. It was to be, perhaps, uh, you know, initially there weren't to, to be the cornices, there weren't to be uh, this grand, these two grand flight of staircases and so on. It would have been more eloquent of the kind of insertion a reconstruction even on the inside. That wasn't to be because the clients decided they didn't want that. Now, um, obviously that's where uh, the traces of history, the traces of damage are covered up. But I think that the exterior is very much still you know, eloquent of, of the maintenance of the traces. But, you know, for instance, just one last thing about this, you know, it, it, there is in, for instance, Dalgas, which can be easily missed, you know, that, to, that aspect of German, uh, which is related to Tessanov and so on, which is this very strong laconic aspect, which is also present in a number of other of the examples we give. But, I mean, even if the staircase is not what, you know, the laconic power of the staircase is definitely there, mm -hmm. and you cannot say, well, I'm you know, no, but, 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 but are you also saying that it isn't... I mean, Dolgas is in part responsible for that reconnaissance sure. strength of that. Absolutely, but no, then no, that is intended. Yes, look, uh, I, I, I realized uh, during your presentation that it's, it's probably much more important the way of the, the lecturer looks at the buildings than the selection. Because, uh, well, you do a very interesting point of view, and in my opinion, very polemical, also being very baseful and presenting things as, let's say, obvious. But uh, anyway, you take out all kind of conflict or uh, mm, and discussable, uh, discussable situations, and also you present the uh, all the things as 
springing from the metier, from the obvious rules of architecture, and becoming uh, as they are, because almost it seems that the, it was not all the all chance to do that. That seems to me a healthy position in favor of the, 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 the metier of architecture, but also it catches uh, the, let's say, the contradictions and the, the ideological problems and the, the, the different variety of uh, decisions who could be made. And also, in some cases, uh, I become a little bit astonished. For example, in front of the Philharmonic, uh, the Philharmonic building, because first of all, for me, it's one example of Gesamtkunstwerk uh, and not uh, a laconic building at all. Second, uh, you didn't mention uh, important aspects as uh, his, his, his particular tectonic particular situation in this chaotic place which is intended to be a big forum but in fact it's a sort of parking of different buildings uh, that uh, well I, I, I accept that I accept that because for me the most important thing is to present let's say some criteria to look at but uh, I think it's necessary also no, to say that Mm, some kind of uh, choose, some kind of taking apart many aspects is, like is part of the, of the... Sure, I would briefly like to enter this, and I think you're right um, that if we talk about Gesamtkunstwerk, and as, as I said, uh, the first director or conductor of that new building was Herbert von Karajan, who was, who was a very autocratic person. Uh, and. It is no coincidence that he is at the center of the building, at the center, at the geometric center. And therefore, if we talk about control, you know, uh, both actual and, and, and kind of geometric, there it is. You know, and, and yes, there was an attempt to uh, engage the, the issue of democracy and the representation of the individual within the group and so on. But there's obviously also this uh, as a hangover of you know the traditional concert hall. No, I think I think that's an important issue to talk about, and I think it's there where one could possibly make a development in the design of concert halls. I mean, for for me yeah, that no, would be I, interesting. What, what, what I'm yeah. trying to say is that I, I, I just used this example, but also uh, your presentation of the uh, lepro leprosy Le 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 hospital. hospital was. Uh, you just look for some aspects, uh, and many others were. You were you were not interested in it. And for example, for me, your parallel between the Romanesque building and the, the sculptures building was a little bit uh, well. Was just for <laughs> la galerie. Uh, my feeling is that there is nothing to do with between Romanesque and this kind of oh. building. Well, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I think it's, it's not only me who has, I mean, the architect has talked about it in private to, to me. So, I mean, maybe maybe it's an intention that you, you don't see, and maybe it's something that is completely superficial, well, and just in words. You know, I, I, I get the no, sense but, that there is a kind of uh, well, uh, similar thinking. We could discuss uh, longer. Uh, but uh, no, I insist. Uh, I think the, the the most important thing is your your uh, position in front of the kind of uh, lecture of each building you you did and, and the, the general uh, position you you present, which is uh, for me it's very uh, healthy in this seminar. <laughs> I think this is there is, a, is there any more your Yes, I just would like to, to, to ask uh, and uh, Ignacy if they could go on tomorrow on this last point because I think it's very interesting what was called, if I understand well, analog architecture because I agree this is a problem with me saying this is a Romanesque chapel and this 
and there is an analogy. And so I, I was looking at your two slides. In one way, I understand very well what it is about, and I have the same doubt that in Yassi, because the light is completely different. Of course. Now, one is extremely analog in, a, in this way, but completely different, and the point I ask me, is it uh, correct or not? And it, it's a complete...